Welcome to the shooting show. This week we're in Ireland with Orion hunting tour guide Nick Latus and client Silas Kirkland and Richard Hampton looking for wild goats and Irish locks. After a rough journey across the Irish Sea, Orion hunting tour guide Nick Latus and host Tommy Hines take two English hunters back on the water, but this time it's on an Irish sea lock in search of feral goats. Their island destination is a perfect habitat for this iconic Irish species. That was an eventful crossing across the lock. Uh, we travelled over yesterday from England uh, with two guests. Uh, we've come over to the west coast of Ireland, stopping at a friend's house and we've got an invite to come and shoot some trophy goats on this island. Uh, hopefully we've heard there is a good a good head, uh, a population of, of feral goats, so you know we stand a good chance of, of success. And hunting goats in Ireland, is that a, a wild affair? Uh, most definitely, believe me, it's, it's definitely not canned. <laughs> They're a very, very good class of, of feral goat in Ireland. Uh, the, the, the billy spot, some very good heads. Uh, definitely an old trophy class. How does hunting goats compare to the, the more common species like roe deer and, and red deer? <laughs> with, with the red deer, I would say, definitely on where I shot down in, in, in Scotland, uh, they're just as hard as to shoot the red deer. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not silly animals. Uh, they can soon, they soon get your wind and they're gone. If it wants to lead billies, it's your sense. Uh, he, he's, he's he's pulling the pack of you. The head the head goes, and it, it's it's not uh, it's not. People seem to think that shooting goats it's uh, it's, it's going to be easy, but it definitely isn't. Nature has reclaimed this vacated island, and the going is tough. But the team has an advantage. Liam was born here, and the island remains in his family. Ireland's feral goat population has burgeoned ever since the unfair land evictions of the 19th century. Rural families had to turn their livestock loose, allowing the newly freed goats to mix with the wild population of the Emerald Isle. The goats here are 70 strong, but locating them is no easy affair. They are wily and the bush is thick. You could easily walk all day without seeing a sign. After a couple of hours, Nick spies two rams basking in the sun. They are both suitable cull beasts and one of them has a bad limp. Ian, a.k.a. Silas, and Richard prepare for the shot. With a second insurance shot, the rams are down. There's the other one. Yeah. You can hide a herd of elephants yeah, in here. <laughs> when the goats have been located, Richard examines his trophy and discovers the reason for the ram's limp. Crawling the maggots. Maggots. Look. maggots, yeah. Look, they're crawling in between the, the cleaves of the hoof there as well. Look. The group celebrate their success as Tommy unveils a wee tipple to toast the hunt. It's alcohol to the Englishman. That's not a boys. No, no choice. choice. So chaps, you've managed to bag two goats. Tell me about the hunt. Yeah, smashing. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, a quick, quick, quick. <laughs> quick walk through the bushes and spotted these two fine goats in the corner. And yeah, made two excellent shots. Mm. Um, I shot first, the other one stood I up. I fired on report when, uh, when Ian had fired. The second goat stood up, I shot that one. It ran into the bushes and uh, on the follow up we found it dead. Found, it found both dead. of them dead. Yeah. Within what ten meters? Yeah, ten yeah, meters. Travel far. Good hunt. Yeah. Nice environment to be. Lovely morning. Can you guys tell me a little bit about the weapons that you've taken out today? Yeah, I was using a twenty-five oh six Proctor rifle with a sound moderator, and it was perfect for the job at this type of range, and it was I ideal. What was yours, Richard? This is an um, Accuracy International in three oh eight. Um, a bit heavy for stalking really, but um, 
at this range, perfect for the job really, no problems at all, um, accurate, hits hard. And ideal for the longer shots? Ideal for the longer shots, yeah, yeah. if you're prepared to carry the weight, it's, uh, it's, it's quite handy. And in terms of ammunition and bullet weight, what, what, are you, what were you using there, These, what is suitable for goats? For goats, um, 150 upwards, 150 isn't it? upwards, 150, so 150 to 180 um, are sensible. They're a tough animal, the skin's tough, um, they will take some stopping, uh, so heavier bullet weight you know, is, is You need something to smash through the bones first of all. Yeah, you want a clean kill. Yeah, so you want, uh, you want a clean kill. So uh, 308 is ideal really. The trip concludes with two perfect cull beasts taken and two happy hunters. The group head for shore, keen to return again. The Brits there knocking off a couple of Paddy McGinty's goats with some nifty shooting. And now, the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News. Sporting Rifle magazine has raised a five-figure sum for Save the Rhino. The magazine has presented the charity with over £10,500, raised by auctioning lots ranging from hunts to equipment to photography courses. The money will go towards equipment for the anti-poaching unit in the Umkuzi Rhino Reserve in KwaZulu-Natal. Poaching is rife across South Africa, but Umkuzi has been successful in combating it in recent years, thanks in part to the generosity of sporting rifle contributors, advertisers and readers. Despite a field that included a number of former world and national airgun champions, the Air Arms RSN-10 Memorial Challenge HFT shoot was won by a rookie shooter, Alex Honeywell. This is teenager Alex's first year of competitive HFT shooting, but he used his customised Air Arms EV2 Mark II to shoot 76 points out of 80 on the challenging 40-shot course. Nigel Allen, editor of Airgun Shooter magazine, was also on form, taking top honours in the Promatic Speed Shoot event. Shooters are hoping to end the game fair season on a high after a summer marred by poor weather and cancellations. A succession of events, including the CLA Game Fair and Great Yorkshire Show, succumbed to bad conditions this year, lending an added importance to this weekend's Midland Game Fair. Organisers said the show was going ahead as planned and circulated a photo of the showground at Western Park saying it was in great shape. If you're going to the Midland, don't miss the sporting rifle stand on Gunmakers Row and the airgun shooter stand in the Airgun Expo. Land managers in Scotland have reported growing amounts of damage caused by wild boar. Sightings have increased dramatically in the last decade in Scotland where it is believed they are being illegally released from farms where they are reared. One farmer in Loch Arbour estimates there are 14 now living close to his croft and said he was losing lambs to them. Scottish National Heritage recently declared a shoot on site policy for Munt Jack Deer, but as yet, no guidance has been given for dealing with boar. There'll be more on this story in the October issue of Modern Gamekeeping. Basque has just launched an online tool designed to help shoot managers. The Green Shoots mapping website will allow members to log in and provide information on their shoot boundaries as well as the range of wildlife and habitats in their area. People can also download customised maps of their area showing a range of information that might be beneficial to planning shoot management, deer stalking, wildfowling and pigeon shooting. It is hoped that the information collected will help both Basque and individual shoots further understand the effects of shooting on wildlife. That was the Shooting Show News. Nick and Byron are at the Irish Game Fair at Burr Castle, not only to enjoy the show, but also to collect a goat that Nick had sent to Kurt Ecker of Pinewood Taxidermy to be mounted and preserved. So is it a long process? It is a long process because you have to take the skin off of it. It takes a long five hours. It's not just the taking the skin off. Right. You have to take sli uh, splitting the eyelids, splitting the ears the whole way up through it. The nose has to be coming off. The lips, the, the skin from the lips goes into the mouth. Right. So all the flesh has to come out from that. So it takes about five hours to do really? that. Yeah. It's being salted two days, one right. day, then the salt is yeah. shaken yeah. off yeah. and it's salted the second day. Right. And after that, it's kind of semi dried. And I don't do the tanning of the big animals anymore myself. Right. I used to do it, now I ship them all over to Germany. Right. And I get the tanning. Now, deers, goats, sheep, that sort of way, right. I send so over, to been over to Germany. This has been over to Germany. This has been over in Germany, right? Yeah. 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 I, f I find they do a better job. Uh, yeah. 
than I could do. Yeah. I find that the skin is very easy to work afterwards and it's, it's, it's quite right. simple, the process. Right. For me, it works better that way. Yeah. And of course, afterwards, you, the skin comes back, you have to make the, the mulch, take the size of them. I take measurements before I skin the animal. Right. So every detail is exactly the same yeah. way as the yeah. animal, no, the original right. animal was. But it works that way and the, the, I choose, I have a couple of different sizes of uh, molds for the different animals. And I choose the closest to it, the closest size fitting for right. it. And I, I, touch, I touch it and I change around as, as I need to. Right. Like if the face is longer, I'll cut off, and stretch it. If it's shorter, I can cut it off right behind the front there, take out the little wedge, and it makes it shorter. So right. that way you kind of work around it. The yeah. same with the neck, you can make it thicker, smaller. Right. Okay. Matching the skin next, the original measurements, that's what I think. Right. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. So that, it was a beautiful goat. I must say that it's one of the very rare, which has a good beard, and it is actually, I like the handlebars on them, yeah, like yeah. The, the Harley Davidson handlebars, yeah, I like those uh, most. Yeah. I don't really like the ones straight back, I yeah, prefer those yeah, ones. The, the, like the and it ones makes, oh, they're yeah. beautiful, yeah, yeah they're yeah. beautiful that way, yeah. yeah. No, it was a beautiful skin, it was easy to work on it as well. So. I'm happy enough the way it turned out, and as oh, long yeah, as I'm, you're I'm happy, happy that's, the, the month, yeah, that so. makes all the difference to me. With Nick satisfied with his newest trophy, we took the opportunity to find out a bit more about Kurt and his fascinating livelihood. Kurt, can you uh, tell me how did you get into taxidermy? It's a rather well, intriguing, uh, <laughs> intriguing industry. Well, it's something like that. I was growing up. I was always interested in animals in my youth. Uh, 1984, I, I found a, a beautiful magpie. It was summer, really the breeding season was there, and it, the colours were unbelievable. I brought it to a local taxidermist in Kilani, and he kept me hanging and hanging, and he wouldn't. It didn't work out for me anyway. There was blood on it. He couldn't do that, and. So the next thing I got, I said, I'll chance it myself. And I did, and it worked okay. I found it was not bad. I showed it to a few friends, and they were happy enough, and they said, go on, make it better. Go ahead and get your taxidermy license, or what they call here, wildlife dealer's license. I did, I applied for that, and uh, I just worked from there on. It was, it was a hobby, it was a sideline, what I was doing. Uh, and it just spread from there, it just mushroomed. And at the moment, uh, I do everything, the last 10 years, I'm doing taxidermy full time. Before it was 20 odd years, I was doing it just as a hobby. And of all the animals that you've had come through your workshop, what is your, your favorite to process? Well, at the moment I do quite a lot of deer heads and I must say I enjoy doing deer heads. I used to do, oh, I must have done hundreds and hundreds of pheasants. It was monotonous. If you do pheasant every day and every day, it gets monotonous. I like the challenge. I really drive on challenge. The more, the more difficult, the more I love it. I, I enjoy doing those things. Yeah. And exotic species, have you...? Uh... Expo exotic species, well, it would be the odd, the odd birds, like uh, the white-tailed sea eagle, which were reintroduced in Kerry there the last few years. I have done one of them. This was a tough one. It was poisoned. This was one of the poisoned ones. And it was post-mortem, and it was cut up to pieces. It was like a jigsaw puzzle to put it together. It was a challenge, but it turned out perfect. Uh, most exotic one would be a Brazilian tapir. I did that maybe about seven, eight years ago and it was a full-size animal. It died in the museum. It didn't die, actually, it was put down because it had problems with the hips. And after six months, the hip kept jumping out of it, so they had to put it down. It was over two years in the freezer, so they had to defrost the freezer to get it out, and it was a difficult job. It was about 180 pounds, five foot, three, five foot long, three foot high. And I, I did that for them. It is, it is at the moment exhibited in the National Museum in Dublin. And of all the species uh, that you've taken in, what is the most difficult to get right? The birds, I'd say woodcock is one of the difficult ones. If the, the skin is so thin that any little hole inside it is from shooting it, it just tears everywhere. I find it extremely difficult. That's one. And, and uh, hares and rabbits, again, the skin is extremely, especially the ears. You pull up the ears and they just tear apart. So it's, yeah, they are difficult enough. That's it from the Emerald Isle. We're out every Monday, 7.30 p.m. UK time. This is The Shooting Show.